I uh, appreciate everybody uh, showing up for this morning. Uh, Peter Davies did a real nice job, I think, laying out some of the background and past, present, and uh, future, maybe some of the direction that we're going to have with antimicrobial uh, issues in use in agriculture. And, uh, of course, we're really here because of the pressure uh, on uh, antimicrobial resistance and what kind of role does agriculture play in that, livestock production in particular. And so that's kind of what led uh, to the FDA um, really reworking some of the rules and regulations. And um, a lot of that is uh, obviously going to hit front and center here uh, January 1st. So we'll visit about that. I went to Fairmont in 1992 when I graduated at Minnesota, and I bought a used vet box. <clears throat> and uh, I think back on that because there was a partially full bottle of chloramphenicol in that vet box. And so we were talking ahead of this uh, session this morning. You know, there was Ferox, there was Ipermidazole. There was a lot of things that were done before the three of us were in practice. Uh, bulk product was getting uh, manufactured basically into other products in, uh, in clinics and, and in, pr in practices. And so there's been a lot of changes already. And so uh, I guess it's part of uh, the evolution of the industry that will probably have more changes. And people want to know about their food. So uh, that's kind of sets the scene. Uh, so today, uh, yeah, Pete and I will talk about the VFD rule and implications, but also kind of more generally about maybe some strategies and thoughts going forward on just general antimicrob antimicrobial use in, in, uh, in pigs uh, for industry and for producers. So 2003, uh, Guidance 152 was released, which really uh, kind of started to define for us what are those drugs that are probably going to and are receiving the most scrutiny and the most uh, regulation. So this Appendix A, which I'll have a... Uh, uh, that'll show up on the screen here in a little bit, um, was identified as being human important drugs. Um, Guidance 209 came out in 2012, which uh, talked about what is judicious use and uh, attached veterinary oversight as a key piece of what will be going forward, a, a main component uh, for use of antimicrobials, any, any antimicrobials in uh, animal agriculture. 2013, we got guidance 213, and that began the process of looking at voluntary label changes for feed uh, products, feed antimicrobials, phasing out production uses, and identified this as a three-year timeline. Also talked about moving over-the-counter um, uh, water medications to prescription. So by January 1, whether it's injectable water or feed use of antibiotics, um, and if it's on at all this Appendix A, then it will be under the guise of veterinary oversight. And in 2015, uh, kind of completed that process with uh, what, what does veterinary oversight mean and attached it to those Appendix A uh, products. And so here we are. We're fast approaching uh, January 1 and actually we'll have to be prepared and implementing ahead of January 1 if we're going to meet the rule. Here's Appendix A. Uh, you can see the top uh, products that uh, are classified as important, highly important, or critical for human health. The bottom ones, there will be some products that uh, currently will not require VFD, and uh, so it might change some usage patterns as well. So antimicrobial resistance is identified as the big issue that is driving this. There's other issues too, but that's the primary one. And uh, they're not really concerned so much about antimicrobial resistance in livestock, although it's an issue, and we in practice and industry deal with that too. And uh, I think we try to use, you know, appropriate information and targeted use, and we'll, we'll get into some of that. But they're primarily, of course, worried about it for human health. So removal of growth promoters, uh, identifying uh, that all these uses will require very oversight. <clears throat> We're going to talk about, Pete and I, a little bit about the time and the costs we anticipate going forward to comply with this. Um, you know, until we get there, we don't really know that definitively, 
but we'll uh, give at least some ranges maybe on what we think we can expect and, and some options maybe on how we uh, think we'll be dealing with that going forward. Um, in the swine industry, we're maybe more ready than others uh, compared to beef and dairy and some of the small ruminants and such. Um, you know, we've had for a long time, I think, a close relationship in most production systems with veterinarians. And uh, that's definitely a strength of our industry. I think you see it. And one of the reasons even at the Lehman Conference you see the strength of this program because we have this collaboration and this communication and relationship with production and veterinarians. And so that's going to serve us well. We're also the only uh, food group that's had to deal effectively with uh, products that are already underneath the VFD um, process. So I'll kind of briefly go through some of the objectives, I guess, as I see for VFDs, and then get into maybe a little more about strategy uh, going forward. Um, so this is maybe not new information to people, but um, you know the legal things that we need to, as veterinarians, think about to be in compliance. Um, obviously, we've got to be licensed where the pigs are. Doesn't matter where the feed's coming from. Uh, valid VCPR, a legitimate relationship, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, it needs to be a written document, can't be a verbal. Doesn't necessarily have to be a hard copy, could be an electronic, secure copy, but it needs to be written. The veterinarian, the client, and the distributor all need to get a copy of that document and maintain records of that. You need to retain the VFD for two years and be available for FDA inspection. What kind of level of inspections we have going forward, I think we don't really know yet. Um, obviously, we're all subject to them already. Um, if there's uh, compliance issues, uh, uh, the, the, VF, uh, the FDA certainly can come in and, and visit us already. So this will um, give them another channel to uh, check up on us and make sure the system's working. Um, there's a one-time requirement to register as a distributor if you'll be uh, distributing product to uh, producers or other distributors. And so that's a, that's a requirement also that, uh, that we'll have some producers that will need to do that. So what's a valid VCPR? Um, generally, the FDA, uh, not generally, the FDA does defer to each individual state's practice act if those states define that. Uh, some don't, so then it defers to the federal definition of VCPR. And that includes engaging with that client to assume responsibility for making clinical judgments about health. And also, I think this piece is important, the client agrees to follow instructions. So we should have that in our households. But um, I have had occasion one time to fire a client and it was related to antibiotic use. This was about 10 years ago. And I think um, we need to make sure that we are responsible actors, and that includes on the vet side, but also have a legitimate relationship that we can you know, trust that things are getting done right. We're sharing responsibility for the use of these products. And if there's a problem downstream, a residue, an issue of not following the legal um, parameters, then our name's on there too. We're involved as veterinarians. So we need to have a, a good relationship and a trust factor between that producer and the veterinarian. <clears throat> we need to have sufficient knowledge. And that's a little bit gray probably today. The FDA, we'll get into that a little bit. What, what is sufficient knowledge? I don't think every veterinarian and every system maybe has the same idea of what that is. I think there's some variation out there. And I think we'll, uh, it might be good for have some discussion today, this morning, uh, in the room as we get done with our, um, our, our lecture, or our, our talks, to just kind of talk about what's, what's legitimate, what's reasonable going forward. And, and uh, obviously the FDA, I guess, will have the final say in that. But um, I think it's important that it's a real relationship, that we truly do have an understanding. Because how can we be targeted to making the best decisions if we, we aren't in touch with what's happening on that farm. And then uh, be available for a follow-up um, with that group of pigs or with that flow. Um, if, if, we, if we don't see effective uh, um, 
uh, treatment and have uh, care that is causing that patient to improve, then we need to know about that so we can use that to make better decisions down the road. This is one of Pete's farms he goes to, he shared with me. Uh, I think it's a guilt multiplier. <laughs> um, but site visits is going to be part of that, you know, uh, and so is uh, clinical observations, of course, postmortems, diagnostics, production records, service team reports. I mean, there's just a whole host of information today that's different and that's expanded and has a lot of value for us in understanding uh, what's really happening within a herd, uh, developing that herd profile that's different than just looking at pigs. And so I think we, we also share some responsibility in educating the FDA. And when I was on the committee for the veterinary oversight, we got into some pretty deep discussions on that. That, you know, we use diagnostics, we use evidence-based information to make these decisions. And so, uh, you know, some of us think we have a better understanding of a group of pigs where we've had that information, even if I haven't been to that particular barn within the flow, I've been to other barns you know, placed prior to that, placed after that. Um, I don't think site visits are the only thing that gives us information. And they're important, but I think they're not exclusive to really understanding what's happening in that herd, obviously. So VCPR is a partnership. And I, th I think as veterinarians, let's stand up and, and, you know, this is an opportunity. Peter, you talked about that that this is an opportunity and uh, how to aptly put it, we've been handed the football. Um, I didn't think Adrian Peterson was maybe the right choice to have on your slide. <laughs> okay, he's been known to fumble at key times, so hopefully we're doing a little better than that. <clears throat> um, so legal also, uh, you know, we're going to have to stick our heads as veterinarians in the feed compendium and know kind of the details of some of these products and uh, get out and, and look at these new labels. Some of them are starting to, to show up. Uh, if you go on the VFD Central uh, site for feedstuffs, you see some transition labels. You see it's starting to trickle through, but I know that companies are a little nervous about putting it all out there until everybody's doing it. So I think a lot of those maybe won't be completely out available to us till December. But I think we anticipate, you know, uh, that, that really the changes will be the loss of the growth promotion and feed efficiency claims. And so those will be the uses that will be dropped. Uh, we don't anticipate there will be other changes on those labels, at least today. Um, important to know that that feed that's in the bins and in the feeders on January 1 needs to have had a VFD. So we can't wait till January 1 to write them. We have to write them for the feed that's going to be in there on site in those barns uh, on January 1. So that's something that we've been really impressing on producers in our practice is that we have to get ahead of the curve on this so that we're actually starting this process for sure by mid-December. Um, in some cases, maybe ahead of that, just to make sure we got the bugs worked out. Accurate. Um, won't spend a lot of time here. There's just a lot of kind of detail things that need to be on that form. Um, there's no requirement that you use a special form. You just have to make sure all this information is on that form. So if you choose to make your own forms, you can. Uh, that's uh, at, at the discretion of the veterinarian. But all, the, all those forms, whether electronic or paper, they have to have this information. And that's obviously all available on, on multiple different sites, websites. And I've got a couple of those references at the end of my uh, talk. Need to be accurate, uh, you know, kind of as we talk about it with producers, um, we think of it in terms of two categories of VFDs. There's going to be kind of based on the herd profile, based on that relationship and understanding we have of the health on that farm, uh, there'll be kind of anticipated problems that we see with with that flow of pigs or with that specific site. And so those won't be too difficult to manage because we'll have some lead time. We know when pigs are getting weaned. We know when the problem typically hits in that flow. So we have a little lead time. I think we can deal with those. The harder ones probably will be disease outbreaks or emergency type situations. 
Uh, we do a little bit of cattle work yet. Cat, you know, you get calves in, and um, sometimes you have some real issues in a hurry in a cattle yard. Uh, same thing on pigs can happen. We uh, in a fairly pig dense area in southern Minnesota, and um, you know, you get flu coming through, and then other things stir up, or purrs is moving through a neighborhood, and so those are a little less hard to, or more difficult to, an to anticipate. And so. Um, whatever process you work through within your uh, veterinary clinic or system, we need to be able to kind of handle both of these, right? So the goal is, of course, right feed medication to the right pig at the right time. Uh, we aren't always going to need medication, but when we do, we want to make sure that we get it done right. Efficient, um, obviously, uh, we're, we're going to be adding time to uh, the plate for for Pete and I and, and a lot of you in the room to deal with this. Uh, one thing that uh, we were able to convince the FDA, a lot of groups uh, commented on this and it made a difference, is uh, the six month expiration window now. That's the max you can write VFDs for on these products that are converting uh, to uh, VFD usage. Uh, so it gives us a little more lead time. Essentially, you know, that's a wean to finish turn. So, uh, for pigs, that, that works pretty good for us. We can live with that. You can certainly write it for less that, less than six months. That's at the veterinary discretion. But we have a window that, that's fairly reasonable. Uh, a VFD can be written to a flow. We spent a lot of time explaining what's a flow, um, giving some examples and, and trying to educate there. And I think we need to continue to give feedback to the FDA on, on that and other issues uh, because uh, it does help. Um, and it's, it's really the only recourse we have is continue to educate and reach out. Um, but uh, a VFD can be written to a flow. Um, the, the only restriction really for a VFD uh, in that respect is uh, it has to be the same owner and the same distributor. It could be a distributor that maybe has two or three or five mill locations, so feed can come out of whichever mill works or whichever mill they want to plan to deliver out of. Um, but uh, that that helps us a little bit, uh, and that's a fairly new uh, change or interpretation that they gave us here this summer is that it could come out of more than one location as long as that that's the same distributor. So that's a helpful thing. Um, we don't uh, need to list the tons of feed anymore like we did on the first couple of products that required VFDs. Uh, now we do still need to list an approximate number of animals that will be fed with that VFD during the course of that six months. Uh, so um, they do want to have that information, but we don't need tons, which was really difficult to be close on in a lot of cases anyway with sick pigs, how do you know how much they're going to eat, right? Um, we're not required to deliver a hard copy. It can be a paper copy, but an electronic that's a secure e-signature uh, system um, is, uh, is acceptable and I think will obviously be used in the vast majority of the cases, uh, particularly in swine. Um, you know, in our experience dealing with the VFDs we had so far, kind of that 10 to 15 minutes per VFD between vet time, you know, communication, uh, staff time that assists in a lot of cases with those VFDs. Um, I guess that's a kind of a ballpark that we anticipate will probably not change a lot going forward. Uh, that doesn't include time we're going to spend, you know, looking at options that we've already been doing, doing a lot of prep work and getting client information together and sites, premise IDs, the the feed mail information, all the emails and all the, the phone numbers and all those contacts that we want to have, uh, we're working on currently, have been working on and still working on um, so that we can be accurate when we get to the point of needing to write these VFDs. So uh, just to add a couple of examples, <clears throat> excuse me, um, so this would be a producer that maybe just has one site, um, just three barns, you know, a nursery with a couple of finishers. Um, and so in a lot of cases, you know, what we've done in the past, and I think I anticipate we'll still do in a lot of cases, we'll be writing these VFDs and under uh, special instructions, connecting that to a specific diet. 
Um, because obviously feed's budgeted, generally it gives us an idea of the amount of time they'll eat any given diet. And, and so we can feel we can have good compliance that way on matching what needs to happen uh, based on the label of the feed medication. And so, uh, so that's uh, kind of what I tried to outline in this situation. You know, maybe this first nursery diet is fed for, for approximately a week of time. The second nursery diet um, fed uh, for approximately a week of time or maybe two weeks of time. Third nursery diet for a couple more weeks at a time. Um, you know, 14 days is the max you can be on for a, a tetracycline product um, in a row, 14 consecutive days. Uh, I think our industry has probably not always followed that perfectly. I think um, we need to be cognizant, cognizant of that and be better at that. Um, have less slop in our system so that we're more accurate. Uh, and I think the FDA is going to, they're going to come out and check. I think that's the reality. And so, uh, and feed medication is always supposed to be fed, always legally needs to be fed according to the label only. We don't have the authority, obviously, as, as veterinarians to change that. So I think, you know, there's going to be some value in the fact that we're putting our heads into the compendium a little bit more and having those communications with the farm. I think we'll be a lot tighter and a lot, a lot more uh, accurate in usage out on the farm. So uh, I see that as uh, creating some benefits for us long term. Oh, just to make a comment, you know, some products, for instance, the BMD won't require a VFD. So in this particular case, I think it's real possible there'll be a lot of a lot of situations, it, it won't require that many VFDs for some of our producers that get pigs delivered, say, on a, on a wheel out of a uh, farm that's, uh, you know, jointly owned with other producers. And that's a fairly common thing in the industry yet for independents. This is a different way to look at that. This would be a sow flow with nine producers. So pigs get sold technically um, from that jointly held unit out to the individuals. That doesn't always happen either. Sometimes it's a joint ownership that goes all the way through to the end. So that'll change how your number of VFDs as well. So you need to, you know, understand the, the business side of uh, the, the legal side of the entity because that'll change how you can handle some of this information, how you do these VFDs. Um, but for instance, producer one has some pigs that get fed out of, out of his farm mill. He's got a, distant, more distant location that gets fed out of a commercial mill, well, that's going to require, you know, kind of doubling up in, so to speak, the number of VFDs because it's two different mills, right, that are different ownership. Um, so those are just kind of some of the details that we got to familiarize ourselves or familiarize ourselves with um, going forward. So in this case, you know, with uh, nine different owners and eight mills, it can be a lot of VFDs for kind of what has have been a lot of sort of common type usage. Uh, this would be CTC Denegard, Thailand, CTC, BMD, obviously, uh, Palmatil. Just threw some different kind of scenarios out there, but um, that's uh, that, that gets to be a lot of VFDs. So we need to have a process that kind of makes this as efficient as possible. Um, this would be a producer that gets pigs out of several different units different flows with uh, uh, 20 sites in this case. And depending on the health profile, we might not necessarily need to write these to a flow. If we're dealing with a system that, you know, a, a, a profile on that herd that's very much the same from one farm to the next, um, we don't necessarily need to write it to the flow. We can write it to, to the producer in that case. Those pigs may be in the same general area have the same challenges in terms of bacterial respiratory disease or intestinal disease. And so that's legitimate and that's a targeted, you know, totally appropriate use of products and in how we handled VFDs. So um, kind of just had a couple different numbers here. If you did write it strictly to the flow versus if you had some similarity, you know, there's a range there. So it'll be different by producer in our case. Uh, it'll be different uh, by herd, by flow, um, and so uh, it's a little hard to 
estimate until we get there. Just you know, I'd like to say I'm probably going to write 2,000 VFDs or whatever it is, but it's we're still kind of working through that. But I think you need to start now. A lot of us are because um, that'll help us uh, when we get to December. Um, so this is a, a VF, uh, just a kind of an example. I just did a spreadsheet to show you kind of the things that we need on that VFD um, that to fit um, the slide ahead before on all the all the different details that you need. So we got the date issued, and uh, again, generally for for these products, it'll be six months is the longest again that you can write this for. Um, the veterinarian, the address, contact phone for that veterinarian, the uh, site pigs are at, owner, um, or sorry, the, the site the pigs are going to, the premise ID, and address, etc. Number of pigs, approximate number of pigs that, that are going to be treated with this uh, under this VFD, the duration of medication, the medication itself, the duration of use. Uh, you have the option. Uh, for those products that can be fed in combination, you have the option as a veterinarian to either restrict that to, to not in combination or to allow that as combination. You also have the option of saying it needs to be specific to a brand of product or where there's more than one brand of the same um, uh, medication, you can allow uh, a, repla a replacement or uh, write it generally so that they can choose more, you know, either one that, that they want to purchase to use. It's kind of confusing. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, the level of inclusion, the expiration date, withdrawal information, uh, client name, address, contact, the email, um, and then a, you need to have a statement that there's, it's not allowable for extra label usage. Uh, flow, very much same kind of information, obviously more pigs. And then you would need to have all the sites that would be connected with that flow. On time, communication um, I think is going to be the key for that. And like I've already mentioned, preparing now and getting to some trial runs. Um, I know that the Global Feed Link has an option within their system to allow you to do trial runs once you have information inputted um, so that's available in that situation I know there'll be paper copies from sponsors obviously like we've had already uh, and then uh, Pete will talk probably a little bit you know there's options you know you can do your own um, so a um, lot of options but you you know we need to we need to get through the process and, and make some decisions so we're ready to go um, Mention that we get, we're going to have to be ready ahead of January to hit January. So that's just kind of a out, uh, outline really of kind of the, the things we need to be aware of with the rule. Um, you know, more generally, I think it's, it's not just VFDs that are coming at us. It's water use. And I think just the whole concept of what's the best way to attack problems and be targeted on the farms. And, so what we're finding is that it, it's kind of causing us to have some good discussions with clients. Uh, kind of step back, good reason to step back and evaluate the programs we have today, the problems we have on the farm, and, uh, and maybe where we can improve the system, the flow, the numbers of pigs, the, you know, the, a lot of things, maybe health upgrades. And so it's causing us to ask some questions. Are we focused on the right things? Uh, you know, you get busy, you're grinding down the road, taking care of emergency things, and really this forces us to step back and say, is our plan right? Is it working for the pig, the producer, for the processor? We're having discussions with where these pigs get killed from our producers so that we are all on the same page. Is the antimicrobial use fitting the new regulations? What you're doing today, will that even work going forward? Is that reasonable? So water, diets, vaccines, there's other inputs too that are very important to health and uh, maybe sites, you know, we, we've got some sites with some really bad water, high iron, uh, sulfates, uh, salts. Uh, is it time to look at a water treatment system? Uh, we're asking, you know, other kinds of questions that go beyond antimicrobial use. Vaccines, are we getting um, the right product in place? 
our timing? Could we improve timing? Will that have an impact on health and maybe change our requirement or when we would think about using medication? So um, I guess we're asking more questions. Reevaluating re -evaluating pig flows. Um, you know, biosecurity is getting a lot of attention. Uh, we haven't slowed down getting uh, new truck washes and dry bays installed. That's that's still happening, and they're they're still effective. And you know, if we can keep these pigs cleaner, we don't have to medicate uh, near as near as often or as, for as long. Um, neighborhoods, we've had producers swap sites so that. Uh, if their sow farm is surrounded by pigs from four other sow farms, you know, maybe it would make sense to consider some alternative pig flow there. Work with the neighbors to reestablish, you know, neighborhoods that are a little more uh, buffered against other flows. We happen to get a lot of flow. I think we get the, we're like the Statue of Liberty in Martin County. We get the poor, the tired, the downtrodden pigs come to Martin County. So we have neighborhoods that are challenges. Um, so it's time to, you know, have some communication with those other producers and, and think about how we can improve that. Um, flow dedicated trailers, uh, mentioned washes, um, is the right fit. Um, I know there's some expansion going on today. Some of that is getting to a better pig flow, expanding some farms to a size that flows better, fills tighter, causes us to hopefully have an impact on health. Defining the health profiles, um, we've got some great diagnostic centers out here. Uh, Minnesota is certainly one of them uh, that we happen to work with quite a bit. If, if we get them a better history and a more complete description of connecting the flows and tying the information together, we can do queries that are pretty helpful uh, and I think uh, move the ball down the field a little bit. And so I'd encourage, uh, you know, all of us in the room to, to do a better job of that um, so that we can utilize that information better. And I think Pete's going to talk a little bit about that, too. Uh, health upgrades. Quite a bit of discussion at this meeting on mycoplasma and some other things that may be opportunities today with a different um, kind of value proposition to improve the health of the herd. Um, we're continuing to do uh, some mycoplasma elimination projects on farms as we've been able to get um, healthier gilts available. Uh, we want to make sure we take advantage of that on sow farms. And uh, obviously that will help us on our usage and need for uh, medication and vaccine and so on. Uh, siting and biosecurity, it's not easy to permit new sites, um, not easy to to uh, expand some sites, but uh, being smarter again about the neighborhoods, I think, is something we want to do. So planning ahead, um, I, th I think there's some, some real opportunities for veterinarians to lead in communication and to make sure we're targeting the problems better and, and be educators. Um, you know, are we, uh, are we telling or are we teaching? You know, we get a lot further down the path if we can teach why things are important and why we want to do it a different way and why we feel the outcome can improve. So uh, I think uh, use, use those skills and in, uh, in the information we have today to, to really help uh, get a better understanding out here on the farms. These are just a few questions, I guess, that have come at me from producers, from feed mills, um, from other veterinarians. Uh, and I think we'll save some time and, and kind of dig into that. But, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that producers are asking me about a lot is how can we plan ahead when sometimes you don't know what pigs are going to go to Frank's site, right? So they may have several flows, and, and so they're trying to be efficient with stocking and barn utilization, and so they're shifting sometimes what pigs go to a certain site. Um, so for writing things by flow, that can be a difficult thing to manage. Um, so that's one of the issues we've had. A lot of questions on who needs to register as a distributor. Um, if you register, does it put you on a list for more inspections? Um, if you don't register, 
Uh, is it going to be harder to have just-in-time manufacturing when you need to be able to make feed and have medication? Um, so there's some pros and cons there. Maybe there's some uh, good input in the audience today when we get to the end of the um, presentations. What's next? Peter uh, talked a little bit about uh, last week there was a, a release by the FDA to, to ask for uh, comments on targeted durations of use for medications that currently don't have uh, a use duration listed. And so there again, I think it's up to us, the onus is on us to give them some feedback. Um, let's not ignore that opportunity to, to address that. Um, a little frustrating, quite honestly, as I wear my vet hat, that before we even implement rules January 1, they're changing the rules. Very frustrating to me. Um, but that's, that's what's happening. Uh, antibiotic usage data, Peter, maybe uh, he commented on that earlier this morning. Uh, several groups kind of working on how we could maybe put some ideas together. Um, obviously, again, you know, worry about how we'll get beat over the head with whatever we put together. So we need to stay in conversation with the FDA and uh, stay in conversation with each other so we can have some kind of uni unanimity there. Uh, so a set of challenges for us, getting the process right, you know, from the detail side with VFDs. Uh, challenges, I think, on animal care to be able to do these things timely and be targeted and, and not have animals that suffer because of it. Um, I think we better get after this so that we can get some trial runs done before January. Um, and there's some opportunities, however, I think, to improve the relationships between uh, myself and my clients within uh, your situations as well. And uh, there's opportunity to maybe uh, fine tune our information systems so that we can be uh, more accurate and be more effective with the treatments that we have. Um, this is in, uh, in, the, in the proceedings uh, online, but, uh, and you can go online to see it too, but if you do register, Producers uh, that deliver, we have some producers that make feed for other producers. Um, they're going to need to register, for instance. Um, so there's situations definitely where it's appropriate. Um, I talk to regulators, I get differences of opinion on this. Some tell me that, boy, every producer is ought to register. And some tell me that, hmm, I don't think you want to be on that list unless you have to. So <laughs> maybe we have someone from the FDA here. That's a little bit of a puzzle to me when I get very different answers on that. But regardless of route, we want to make sure that we're leading and we're judicious 